Okay, so it's on top of the hour. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today um, for today's student research seminar session with Addison Black from Mississippi State University. Um, she's going to speak about lightweight vehicles with carbon fiber composite parts. Um, Addison is an undergrad researcher at, the, at Mississippi State University. And um, yeah, without further ado, I'll leave it to you, give it over to you, Addison. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Addison Black. Uh, I'm an undergraduate researcher at Mississippi State University. I'm studying for a degree in civil engineering. And on this project, I've worked with both the Center for Advanced Vehicular Systems and the Advanced Composites Institute in order to compile a brief introduction into carbon fiber composite parts and in a vehicle. So for a little bit of quick background information, why would you even want to reduce a vehicle's weight? In terms of performance, uh, reducing a vehicle's weight will allow you to decrease ground pressure and running, which will increase off-road mobility. It will reduce the weight of unsprung mass, improving right and acceleration, improve transportability, braking and handling, increase towing capacity and reduce fuel consumption. Lightweighting specifically is replacing aluminum or steel vehicular parts with comparatively lighter and stronger carbon fiber pieces. Carbon fiber has a much higher strength to weight ratio than these other metallic materials. And for parts of similar strength and durability, you can have up to 40% weight savings for aluminum and up to 75% weight savings for steel. So a carbon fiber composite part, a fiber reinforced plastic part is made up of two parts. It's made up of a reinforcement, which will be a fiber, and it's going to be infused with a liquid matrix. And this will be a polymer, a metal, or other ceramic. The material properties of the entire composite will depend on both the type of fiber used and the matrix used, as well as the production method for infusing the fibers with the matrix. Specifically, a carbon fiber reinforced polymer or a carbon composite part will be carbon fiber infused with a polymer resin. So for carbon fiber fabric, fabric is made up of yarn, which are made up of carbon fibers about five to 10 micrometers in diameter. And these are composed of carbon atoms. So these fibers are weaved into varying patterns making up a fiber. So um, the thread count of particular weave is measured up into the thousands of uh, carbon strands. And the number of threads you have, uh, the higher number of threads will equal a tighter weave. So the varying weave patterns you'll have um, for each fabric, looser weaves will have more fray potential and are generally easier to work with, but um, tighter fabrics will be a lot um, sturdier and will be a little more difficult to work with. Um, one potential issue you'll have when working with tighter fabrics is the issue of crimp. So crimped fibers are when high angles in the yarn and very tight weaves can cause stress points that will weaken over time in carbon fiber fabrics. So this is very important to keep in mind when choosing fabrics for your part. So for carbon fiber fabrics, here are some very common weave patterns that you can find. So the first one would be a one by one plain weave. This is a simple over under weave pattern, just over one, under one, over one, under one. It's very easy to handle. It has a very tight weave, but um, it does have very low drapeability. So it's hard to work in complex shapes and it does have high crimp. So plain weave is best used for very flat parts or 2D curves. Two by two twill weave is going to be an over, over, under, under weave pattern. This will be a much, this will be a looser weave with higher drapeability than plain weave, but it'll be a little looser and it won't, won't be quite as uh, durable in terms of maneuvering the piece. Um, rather than the one by one though. But um, the last bit was the harness satin, a four harness satin weave. Harness satins come in these patterns. Um, 
you can have over, 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 under for a four harness satin, but there's other varieties. So a five harness satin would have um, uh, four overs and then an under, and then an eight harness satin would have a seven over and then one under. Um, these fabrics are a lot looser. Uh, they have very high drapeability, but they do tend to fall apart if they're not handled correctly, and they have a very, very low crimp. So these fabrics would be used for very complex shapes or very uh, high contour curves. So the polymer binding that you would use for these composite parts, um, these would be the liquid matrix that you would infuse the fibers with. There are two different types of polymers you can infuse with, thermosetting polymers or thermoplastic. Thermosetting polymers will bond chemically when heated and they're cured. So they're only able to be set once, but they have high thermal resistance, strength, and fiber adhesion. And a few examples of these would be epoxy resin, polyester resin, and vinyl ester resin. Thermoplastics, on the other hand, can be melted and reformed and melted several different times. They're able to be um, reshaped over and over again. So um, these are generally cheaper than thermosetting plastic polymers but um, they won't be quite as durable in the long term. Um, some examples of these would be nylon or polyether if you keep them. So resin, thermoset resins are the most common matrix used in karma composites. Uh, there are very different types of resins you could use, polyester, vinyl, and epoxy. So polyester would be the quickest curing resin available. It's relatively cheap compared to the other two options um, and it's fairly easy to store. Uh, it's most often used in mass production and vinyl resin would be an in-between polyester and epoxy. It has a higher increase in chemical and uh, water resistance. And then epoxy resin would be a very strong and durable resin uh, able to withstand high temperatures and, and high chemical resistance. Um, and it's made of a part A type resin and then a part B a partner. So what is the manufacturing process for carbon fiber parts? There's a general outline used when manufacturing carbon fiber composite parts. You'll have an engineering and designing phase where you'll model your composite part, a molding phase where you'll create a mold and then prepare the mold for fabrication. Uh, your next step would be part fabrication, and then you have varying ways of actually um, infusing the resin into the fibers uh, through either wet layup, pre preg elimination, or vacuum infusion. Your next step would be curing and post curing the part in order to build strength, and then your last step would be finishing the part. So the first step would be engineering and design. So a part will be designed around the final part's intended function and specified parameters. Um, these will be the resistances that the part will have to withstand, either temperature-wise or chemical resistance or water resistance, the overall budget for the project, the time constraints as well for the project, and then the, the forces and loading that the part will have to withstand. For composite modeling, um, carbon fiber composite parts are anisotrophic, meaning their strength lies along the direction of their fibers. Um, they're not isotropic, unlike steel and aluminum parts, which are much more easy to design for because their loading um, is the same across the entire part. So for carbon fiber parts, you'll have many different modes of failure that you'll have to take into account during um, modeling fiber failure, adhesive tail failure, out of plane loading, et cetera. And there are a lot of different failure criteria for that. So like, um, for Saiwu and Sai Hill specifically, um, these will all be taken care of in a composite. So, ANSYS or a similar composite modeling software. So these will analyze a design layer by layer of carbon fiber design and will test these complex failure theories. It will um, basically calculate the number of possible failures per layer and then it's sort of a game of trying to minimize potential failures while staying in the parameters of the design. Um, so the design of the composite part depends on the number of layers, the type of weave used for each fly, the type of polymer matrix used, and the production method, as well as all the finishing needed for the final product. 
So carbon fiber composite parts are very, very design specific, depending on your needs of, for the project. So for molding and mold preparation, um, so composite parts will first be constructed by layering plies into a mold. So the mold of a part can be almost anything. You can have a CNC part milled out of foam. You can have it 3D printed and sealed off. It can be a fiberglass mold, et cetera. These can be designed either from scratch or you can actually take an existing part and model the dimensions of that. So for example, in this photo to the right, that Jeep grill that was shown earlier was um, a fiberglass or a, sorry, a 3D printed mold was taken of that and um, was used to replicate the aluminum work with um, carbon fiber composites. Um, so the specific design will um, depend on the exact sort of production method for the part as well of vacuum vacuum infusion will be different than a hand layout mold for, mold, for example. Um, so in addition, the mold should be checked to be free of air leaks, especially for a vacuum bagging, and then a release coating should be applied to make sure that there's no bonding between the part and mold during the production. So here's an example of a mold made of high density polyurethane mold. Um, it was machined on a CNC router. It's very smooth, it's been sanded, and it's been um, it's just ready for release coating to be applied and then it can be used to mold a hood. So for carbon fiber layup, um, carbon fiber plies will be laid into the mold along with any of the um, infusion safe adhesives and tapes to hold dry fibers into place during this. So in this image, we have um, several different layers of fibers going in. Um, it's this design specifically is going to be a, a isotropic ply orientation and the direction of the fibers will uh, load will be carried throughout all orientations of the fibers. So that way it behaves more like an isotropic material. So for part fabrication, you have a variety of different ways you can actually get the matrix into the composite part. So for wet layup, you'll have a resin that is spread into the part by hand using a variety of brushes, rollers, spray guns, etc. Um, you'll use, you can use an impact force to force the resin to be absorbed into the fibers. Um, and then some of the drawbacks to using this though, it can, it can cause dry spots or excessive resin buildup or air bubbles in the part. And excessive air bubbles will cause weakness excessive resin will cause weakness and dry spots will cause weakness. But this is the simplest way to infuse resin into the need any specific equipment. You just need a variety of brushes, a way to spread the resin into the part. The second form of fabrication would be a pre-preg lamination. So this resin system is where the resin has already been pre-impregnated into the carbon fiber. So when the carbon fiber already has the exact amount of resin needed um, absorbed into the fibers. So how this works is this resin is kept refrigerated or frozen to prevent curing until it's, until it's used. Um, but you do often need to cure it in an autoclave to meet high heat and pressure requirements. And those can be very expensive to acquire or um, find when able to be used. Um, and is the most expensive fabric able to be purchased because it is the fabric and the resin already combined into one. For vacuum infusion, resin will be injected into the dry fibers under a vacuum bag. Um, this will be either two part mold injection or through vacuum bagging. So how this works is vacuum pressure will draw resin into the fibers and that's how the resin will be drawn into the part, but it is a very complex setup. And if vacuum is lost during the infusion at any point, this can cause big issues in terms of having dry spots and air bubbles and, and excessive uh, resin. It can, it can essentially destroy a part if it's not 
kept under check. So for wet layup, here's an example of um, someone using a brush to, oops, using a brush to lay up this part with um, resin. They're just painting the resin over the piece and they'll probably, um, they'll impact it a little bit to get the resin to draw into the fibers more efficiently. Um, so resin will basically just be added to the part until the fibers stop absorbing any more resin. But there's a delicate balance between adding not enough resin to where some of the fibers haven't been wetted out fully or adding too much to where you've been your resin rich areas. So this is definitely a delicate balancing act. And to the right, there's a diagram of a uh, hand layup. So you have a variety of different, the mold is on the bottom followed by your reinforcement fiber. And then you can see the polymer resin being poured on top and then being spread out for the roller. So for vacuum infusion, the mold and carbon fibers will be covered in a vacuum with bag sealing tape. Inlet and outlet ports will be cut into the bag and placed around the port, which will allow for tubing to be inserted to allow both resin inlet and outlet and a vacuum suction to be applied. So when vacuum is applied to the part, this will pull the dry fiber sheet close and draw out excess air. So you, you'll have less excess potential air bubbles into the port. Um, they're fed through a pressure pot to allow for degassing of the resin where air bubbles will be extracted from the resin as well before being reintroduced back into the, the fibers and then resin will be let into the part through inlet ports where outlet ports will be drawing it throughout the port until it reaches the vacuum line. So on this photo, you can see the very bottom layer is the carbon fiber themselves and this will be topped by a release fabric and then a breather fabric a vacuum bag and then the yellow bag sealing tape. The release fabric helps to prevent adhesion of the breather fabric into the, the carbon fiber during the infusion. So here's a couple of photos um, basically going into the further detail of the vacuum bagging process. So at the very top you'll have a schematic setup of showing the basic procedure of how this resin is infused. So you'll start off with a resin and this can be, this will usually be fed in through a pressure pot, which will be then be fed into the vacuum bag with the mold and part all under vacuum. And then the resin will be drawn out using the vacuum into a resin catcher, which will allow the vacuum to still be in, um, drawing out excess resin while still protecting the vacuum pump from having resin drawn into it directly. And here's a photo of a completed vacuum bagging setup. So this part is um, under vacuum. Uh, resin has not been added yet, but it's all drawn, it's all drawn down. I'm gonna have a quick video time lapse showing Showing resin actually being fed into a vacuum infusing part. So there you can see the resin going into the part. This is beginning to wet out the part. The vacuum outlet on the closest part is drawing in the resin. So it's drawing the resin to the other side. So this will help draw the resin into all of the fibers throughout the entire part. And here you can see the resin is actually starting to come back out of the outlet tubing, but because the vacuum pump is still drawing resin forward, it's still wetting out the rest of the part. And now the resin, the excess resin through the outlet tubing is entering the vacuum the resin trap to prevent damage to the vacuum pump. So that's essentially the process. 
So the next step would be curing and post-curing after the resin has been infused into the part. So with a wet layup and infusion, and the epoxy resin must cure at a certain temperature after a certain time. So this will depend on the hardener used and the temperature at the actual layup and infusion. So curing can take room, uh, take place at room temperature or in an oven. It depends basically on the type, the type of resin system used. Um, you will have to cure in an autoclave under that high pressure and temperature to make sure the part uh, fully wet, uh, cures. And the option to post cure the part is also available. This will be where the part is put into an oven under high temperatures, which will increase the strength of the matrix in the resin. So this can be done up to about 150 degrees Celsius. That for most systems, that'll be about the right temperature to post. It will depend on your resin. So here's an example of some dry fiber on the left. So this is would be um, an aesthetic layer, basically of honeycomb fabric, just to make a part look good. And then on the right, you can see this is what it looks like after it's been wetted out. So this is after curing. Um, this part has been infused and is fully hardened, essentially. So for finishing the part, take the part of mold after it's been infused. It will be very rough around the edges because you'll have fiber edges that need to be trimmed uh, and parts of it will need to be sanded if you have any resin rich areas will need to be and there's just a lot of finishing parts that you need to do for the part is up to standard so uh after you trim the sand apart you can apply various coats or or layers just like the other part you can apply heat resistant layers or water repellent coats or you can paint it or you would really prefer or you can leave them uncovered if you'd prefer to see the in the part. Um, so finished parts after all of this can then be fit with various fasteners and hinges and fixtures and whatever is required for its intended use as an actual part. So here's an example of a part from essentially conception to finished. So on the left, here's a steel raised N38 hood. It weighed 26. 0.43 pounds, and then the goal was to lightweight this part by making a carbon fiber replica of the exact same dimension. So on the right, you have a carbon fiber composite hood consisting of about eight layers of um, quasi-isometric fibers, and this will come out to weigh about 14.02 pounds. So, um, and this is without the holes being cut into the part, and this is still a, a high weight reduction almost almost 50 percent without without removing uh, the material that should have been removed in from the top of the, the part so before making carbon fiber parts and despite their high advantages to uh, lightweighting a vehicle there are several design considerations that need to be taken into place before um, lightweighting the parts so in comparison to metallic parts like steel and aluminum, uh, those will have two separate manufacturing processes for both the production of the material and the part separately. Um, the issue with composite parts is that they'll use the same process to create both the material and the part at the same time. So a lot of consideration needs to go into both the properties of the final part and the manufacturing process to be used. And all of these factors need to be weighed together before you actually create a compartment fiber composite. So these have several different challenges that are unique specifically to carbon fiber composites in comparison to other materials. So once again, um, carbon fiber is an anisotropic material. So because the, the direction of the fiber is where the strength lies in carbon fiber, you have to take the direction of the part fibers into account before you so an isotropic design will behave the same regardless of a load direction. So that will be steel and aluminum and metallic parts. It's a lot easier to design for those because the load direction doesn't, whereas for carbon fiber, it really does matter because the strength lies in the direction of the fibers 
and whenever you have to make sure that loads are applied in plane as well to ensure that the strength of the fibers, the load travels along the fiber line. Um, so in addition, mechanical properties are difficult to measure um, outside of just very general ranges. So mechanical properties of isotropic designs like steel and aluminum, those have very, those have um, known um, moduluses of elasticity and, and those sorts of things. But for carbon fiber composite parts, there's so many variables. Um, these parts are so specific and so many things can happen during the actual manufacturing process that there's no way to get an exact number, um, even if you use the same same fibers and, 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 and uh, way of production every single time, there's going to be small, slight differences. So it's just, it's too hard to measure an exact for um, when you're calculating these designs. Manufacturing differences, not every metallic part can actually be replaced with a carbon fiber composite. There are certain parts that will essentially for now have to be made of metallics. So um, very complex shapes uh, of a part usually have been designed with injection molding in design. So their geometry of the part will be just very generally unsuitable for replication with carbon fiber due to carbon fiber meeting that directional load. Um, you'll have issues where very large parts will sometimes require joints where several different sheets of fiber are all in the same layer because you, there's not a weave large enough to um, make this part with one sheet. So then you'll have, you can potentially introduce weak zones where the fibers are not continuously connected at those joints. Um, and when you have very complex shapes, like if you have a lot of uh, angles and big three-dimensional curves, um, those can be very difficult to uh, mold with carbon fiber. So um, with, with thorough engineering though, these parts can be likely made of carbon fiber, but it would be a lot more efficient to design from the ground up with the strength and limitation of carbon fiber in mind rather than trying to replicate a metallic part exactly. And certain parts are just unsuitable to carbon fiber composites just due to their nature. So like vehicular frames and springs, um, they're just subject to a lot more violent loading than say a body panel or a drivetrain. Um, they'd be much more likely to fail if made of carbon fiber composites. And it just, it, frankly, it would not be safe to make these essential safety parts out of carbon fiber at this moment. And speaking of that, the failure of carbon fiber, um, when carbon fiber composites fail, they'll fail catastrophically. They'll splinter but, and shatter, but um, they'll often just deform or buckle or in some way. So the, the metallic part won't potentially endanger the user. Um, and there are many different forms of failure for carbon fiber as well. You have potential delamination where the, uh, the layers of fibers come apart. You'll have compressive failure of the fibers. You'll have research cracking and fission potentially formed and uh, too much loading is applied or loading is applied in the wrong direction. And then that's not even encountering manufacturing errors. Uh, if you have resin rich errors or dry spots or, or improper fibers during the production. So all of this can lead to carbon fiber parts that will just end up failing spectacularly. And last but not least, the cost. So um, carbon fiber is more expensive than other materials. Um, the extensive research and preliminary material testing required for many parts can be very time consuming. Uh, you have a high variation of material properties, which requires a lot of preliminary testing to ensure a product quality before you actually go into main. And carbon fiber is just is more expensive. A 3,000 two by two twill weave fabric can run between two to four dollars per yard versus about a, a pound of steel is about 40 pounds. So you have to see a big difference in terms of um, material cost. And then there's also high material waste from ply cutting and, and the trimming of final parts as well, because you have to cut these fibers into shape. You, you can't inject, you can't injection mold these parts where you only use a certain amount of, of metal, essentially. These, you'll have to um, find the balance of excess to cut off 
while not cutting off too much. And you'll also have high levels of plastic waste from using to apply them to the and et cetera. There's just a lot of waste that goes into uh, carbon fiber manufacturing. And production rates will just be lower than long cure times and the quality control needed. And that's, that's not to say that this process can't be automated. It doesn't all have to be done by hand, but um, a lot of it will be done by hand or, or human inspected at some point. So there's just a lot of fine details that need to go into account of the manufacturing of these parts. So in conclusion, there are a lot of unique challenges to carbon fiber composites, but there are also a lot of benefits to using materials reduction while that preserves the initial strength and durability of the part. Fiber parts are very, um, very efficient. They're, they're tailored to a specific shape and application that is designed for that specific part. So this will be essentially the best part you can get for the money. If that, if, um, so in comparison to metallics and steel and aluminum parts. So for low volume production of a thoroughly designed and engineered part, a carbon fiber can be an excellent choice of material to decrease weight and overall improve vehicular performance in terms of. So that would be the end of. Thank you very much, Addison. That was very insightful um, with regards to carbon fiber techniques and manufacturing processes and so forth. Um, I we, we have one question so far in, well, we have two questions so far in the question and answer. Um, I'll read it out to you so you can answer. Uh, which weave shapes has the best directional strength and is there a limit up to where you can go? Which weave shape has the best directional strength? Um, there's actually a weave shape that's called unidirectional fiber. So instead of being woven, it will just be carbon fiber strands in one um, one direction. There, there's no weave. So I would say that would definitely have the highest directional strength. But the only caveat is that would be only in exactly one direction. At least with a different weave, you'd have the potential for um, the directional loading to be applied over multiple directions. But um, with a unidirectional, you'll have one orientation of just a straight fiber. But that would most likely have the best directional strength. And is there, um, like, in, in a specific weave, is there, like, a limit? at Because you mentioned there's um, weave shapes of over, 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 under. Is there a limit up to where you can go with that specific weave shape until uh, some mechanical for some mechanical reason the material is not strong or um, stiff anymore you could theoretically go as as far as you would want especially with the harness satin weave it would just depend on the level of um, level of flexibility versus um, weave strength if that makes sense so um, you have to balance Essentially, will your fabric fall apart while you're trying to use it versus the the, um, the flexibility of the part of the fabric? So I would say as, as would, I think eight harness satin would be about that's sort of the limit I think of most commonly used fabrics, but for certain very specific needs, I, I'm sure you could go higher. But at that point, it might be more easier to is uh, perhaps a unidirectional or at, at that point, a, 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 honestly, a carbon fiber part would probably not be quite as feasible at that point, just because the fabric would be so loosely woven at that point, it would be very hard to, to actually handle during manufacturing. Okay, uh, thank you for that answer. So uh, Dr. Alex Keen asked, where does the carbon come from? Can it come from carbon capture processes as part of uh, carbon emission mitigation? Interesting. I, um, I actually am not familiar with where the carbon comes from. I, I just do know that it's basically extruded out into these fibers. So that is, that is a very good point about um, if it could 
carbon emissions mitigation. I, I, I hadn't thought of that. Like, that seems like it would be definitely something that could be explored. And then I have a question um, related to that question. So you mentioned the different weaves and the work that you're doing. Uh, do you perform the weaves of the sheets yourself at the university or do you rather buy off the shelf um, sheets? You would buy off the company that produce these weaves. They would manufacture all the different going to choose um, the thread count and the weave type and all of that different things. And then if you if you needed a very if you needed a specific weave or something that was more uncommon, um, I'm sure you could work with them and design something very specific. But um, that's usually not done in house. Okay. Um, all right. Yes. Then we have another question in in the Q and A. How does substituting carbon fiber body panels affect impact absorption compared to metal. So I think that that's with regards to uh, crash structures where metal can usually absorb quite a lot of um, energy into it. How, how does carbon fiber stack up? Right. So that would depend basically on the design of the part. If the carbon fiber uh, part is designed in a way to where it perfectly would replicate and absorb the, the impact compared to a metal part, it would be extremely durable and strong. So um, uh, when, as long as the fiber direction, the in-plane loading has been designed to where all of the impact is absorbed into the direction of the fibers, it, it, will, it will be very strong. It would be stronger than metal. The only issue is designing the part to where that loading is applied exactly that loading needs to be designed to where it won't the, the carbon fiber piece won't won't fail due to um, excess or out of plane loading if that makes sense so um, depending on the design of the part but um, yes a carbon fiber part body panel specifically should be stronger than a metallic part yes i i I don't know if you know the company uh, Rimat the Automobili in from Croatia, where they also make the, the vehicle, the monocoque of their vehicle, they make it mostly from carbon fiber, but then this crash structure is still made from aluminum um, parts because just due to the, the folding effect of aluminum if you if you crush it. And I I guess to a degree that that makes sense because if you want rigid rigidity, like very strong, rigid material that does not easily twist itself, then carbon fiber makes 100% uh, sense. But as soon as I think energy absorption is an issue, um, then I believe the uh, more conventional materials and metals is uh, still useful. I see we have Mohit um, on here if you have a question. Uh, hi, Addison. So I had two questions, which maybe you've addressed, but I just want you to reinforce about that. So firstly, when you say lightweighting vehicles, how much of a percentage that is considered the optimal percentage for lightweighting? Because I am of the thought, like if you go beyond a measure for, just for lightweighting and making sure the fuel efficiency is getting optimal, you might end up like generally the tires are designed so as to they they are designed according to certain load that they will face and then they might not be getting that much of a load and it might so my opinion is basically the kind of the area of contact patch or something might change if you reduce beyond a measure so do you would you like to speak about that right so um in regards to, I think, the first part of your question, the ideal, um, what you're likely to get from light weighting for an aluminum reduction in weight of about 40% and for a steel part, that would be a reduction in weight of about 75%. And in terms of like fuel efficiency, it would, there's definitely a balance between, is it actually worth it in terms of the cost to lightweight an aluminum or steel part with a carbon fiber to part? So, um, for example, I, I think about a 10% weight reduction in a vehicle will 
uh, result in anywhere from a six to eight percent reduction in fuel consumption. So um, there's definitely a variety of parameters you'd want to investigate in the engineering and designing portion of the composite part. And, and that's, that's a big thing for uh, composite parts. A lot of the time is actually spent not constructing the part, but designing the part and engineering it to be, to make sure that this part is actually and worth the investment and in cost and labor and thinking. So about, about half the time when creating a carbon fiber part will be actually in the engineering and design portion, just to make sure it makes sense fiscally to actually lightweight this part, if that makes sense. Thank you. So yeah, that's that's was my question because, for example, like if you speak in terms of an on-road vehicle, which is basically moving on asphalt or something, it makes sense to have the weight reduced. But in the case of an off-road vehicle, how much of a difference that's make that would make is something that you would like to like think about. If it's like uneven sandy terrain, you're driving in the middle of a desert, say. Right. So what impact that will have? That's yep. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mohit. I see Dr. Alex Keen has asked the question again in the Q&A. Um, I, I would encourage any one of the attendees to um, click on the blue share audio and video button on your right hand corner, then you can join the, the question session live if you would like to. Um, in the meantime, if we, if there's anyone that wants to jump on, I also have a qu another question. So the idea is to apply this to vehicles. So have you like um, identified any specific vehicle uh, parts? Um, I, I guess that makes the most sense from because my my background is vehicle dynamics. So for handling improvements and um, ride comfort improvements, the unsprung mass is usually the parts that you want to uh, keep the weight as low as possible. So are there any parts that you and your group have identified um, that is re readily changeable to com composite materials like com carbon fiber, for instance, um, for the lightweight, lightweighting um, effects? So um, for my group specifically, in, in my time of working with them, we have not, but drive trains are actually one of the main parts of uh, unsprung mass that you can make out of carbon fiber um, just because the way the the loading is designed on, on the drive train is, is a lot more accessible for a carbon fiber replacement in turn rather than a steel or aluminum part so that specifically yes but other parts like suspension and springs would not be well suited to uh, carbon fiber just because it's high stiffness is the like you said earlier, with the impact um, absorption, metallics will tend to um, deform much readily than carbon fiber, which will um, splinter or fracture. So. OK. Um, OK, so I see Dr. Alec hasn't come on. So I'll just repeat his question. Can carbon fibers be used in 3D printing processes, for example, pellets or yarn? So, so carbon fiber is actually um, is in a variety of materials where the, the carbon fiber is actually encased or otherwise combined with um, a plastic part. And that, that goes back to a lot of the, um, uh, let me pull up that slide really quickly, actually. Um, Right, so um, anyways, um, for binding, um, these thermoplastics, so uh, specifically polyester, uh, either ketone, uh, you can actually combine that with uh, carbon fiber to actually 3D print. Um, you can 3D print carbon fiber composite parts actually using this type of technology. These polymers, um, instead of like epoxy resin, you, these uh, thermoplastic materials that uh, can be melted and are stored as you know pellets and that sort of thing, uh, you can actually combine those in specific 3D printing machines. We actually uh, do have one at ACI that can print carbon fiber parts. It combines the 
carbon fiber thread with the um, plastic part needed. So yes, that, that can be well done. And, and that is actually something that's being explored right now. So. Keena's on the call. Um, is there anything that you want to expand on? Yeah, hello, uh, Addison and, and Andres. Um, well, it partly leads me into the next question, which I haven't put up, which I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you. And that is, um, if we can 3D print fairly easily, is it easy for amateurs like me to use carbon fiber, fiber in prototype projects? For example, uh, if I was going to, to make a small field robot chassis, or I'm building a test rig or something, would it be fairly easy, easy for me to use uh, a 3D printing technique um, or a non-3D printing technique to actually build the chassis? That's a, that's a very good question. So um, actually both of those could potentially be true. It would just sort of depend on part geometry, I would say. Um, outside of the initial cost of the 3D printer itself, because that's a very specific, um, Form of 3D printing uh, is very feasible because a wet layup of carbon fiber, for example, anyone could could do it because the only thing you would need to focus on is procurement of the materials. You could procure either the, the filament, the 3D printer, the carbon fiber, and say PE. PE uh, would probably be a good example of that. Uh, you would the printer and you could do that yourself or use a, a, a probably a wet layup or even a vacuum infusion um, either one is, is fairly simple process because you don't have a lot of expensive equipment that, or specific equipment that you would need to acquire unlike other forms of um like not anyone could do an injection molding for an aluminum part but the process of creating a carbon fiber part is actually fairly simple. It's just a lot of overhead goes into the design and function of the parts. Um, so, but even still, that can be done in a variety of composite modeling softwares. Um, if you have all the dimensions and, and thing and um, yeah. specific loading design for a part, there's nothing stopping you from actually designing and, and manufacturing your own carbon fiber parts. It's just um, a variety of different techniques and understanding of the, the material and how those interact with each other. Yeah. In terms well, of I've, I've, got, I've got access to a, a 3D plastic printer, fairly cheap, but it works. And uh, I've got a, a 3D router as well, which would certainly be able to carve out molds and so on. Between the two, making the mold wouldn't be that difficult. It may actually be easier to make the mold than to try and uh, 3D printing, which I suspect the actual um, uh, printer for carbon fiber might be quite expensive compared to a basic uh, uh, home 3D printer. Um, but making molds, certainly that's no problem at all. 3D CAD, uh, I've got that. A lot of people have got 3D CAD and uh, um, appropriate software. Uh, the design's not not the, the biggest problem. It's the sort of uh, getting hold of the material, I, su I suspect. and. Uh, um, finding out how to do it, probably by trial and error, but uh, it sounds quite quite, uh, quite a promising uh, way to actually build small prototypes. Yes, so that's that's sort of the beauty in carbon fiber. Such a small scale operation, you can design for these very specific parts and for this very specific vehicle without having to worry about the tooling necessary for an injection molding part, you can basically build your own parts from the ground up however you design them and you can make your own molds however you would prefer to make them out of fiberglass you could 3d print a mold you could 3d print a model of a part and then take a mold off of, off of that that part especially if you wanted to do um a part a and part b like male and female type mold um any of that possible depend on the type of part you'd be uh, manufacturing for so it, it's it's all very accessible for essentially anyone to manufacture their own carbon fiber parts and even the material outside of the initial cost the procurement of the material is not that difficult either you can just order from any major um, fabric manufacturer essentially so you can order um, resin systems and um, different plastics and, and that sort of thing depending on just your design 
essentially. Yeah. So it could be easier than trying to make an aluminium chassis, where I'd probably need more uh, more machines uh, rather than actually making a, a, a mould and then sort of uh, working on it. But uh, yeah, I'll keep that in mind if I for another project if I ever get that far. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keen. Cheers, um, all right, so we have another question. Well, we have a few questions, extra questions in the question and answer section. Um, I'll go with the oldest one. So um, this anonymous asked, my experience is in cold weather terrain. Is carbon fiber sensitive to uh, cold temperatures? We also often add weight, so uh, have to increase the weight of the vehicle to improve traction. Uh, and therefore, perhaps lightweight vehicles um, in with that regard is more appropriate for warm weather um, climates like deserts. Uh, do you do you find that to be true? Um, so my expertise manufacturing of, of the actual part and less so in the um, designing portion. So specifically for um, the desert portion or or like sandy terrain or, or hilly terrain. Um, that would basically just sort of depend on the 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 vehicle, the, the, basically the, the statistics of the vehicle. Uh, what, what's the weight of the vehicle, um, terrain it's going on, how how does all of that affect, it, it, does a vehicle need to be lighter or heavier essentially? And if it needs to be lighter than carbon fiber composite would definitely be something to potentially look at, at reducing the weight of the vehicle. But um, I'm not too familiar in uh, cold weather terrain, but um, it does make sense that some in order to improve traction, but um, in other cases, then probably especially for more sandy uh, type soils, then it would be more efficient to reduce weight. To, but um, that's a that's a very good point. I um, but uh, in terms of temperature sensitivity of the car, um, I'm not too familiar with the cold weather temperature, but um, I I can tell you that the temperature sensitivity will probably come more in terms of the matrix you decide to use. So um, an epoxy resin has a higher like thermal resistance, for example. It, it's, it's, you can use it in hotter uh, climates. And, and that, that sort of usually comes for um, in terms of when you have these vehicular parts that are under uh, motion, uh, you'll have like, you know, friction and heat generated from being inside a vehicle. So it needs to be able to withstand the uh, temperatures of say, uh, you know, being around the engine, especially for like a drivetrain part. So um, thermal resistance in that sense, but um, I'm not too familiar with cold weather sensitivity. So, but um, it would probably depend mostly on your matrix and ensuring that it doesn't freeze. But I, that's not my actual piece. So I, I can't answer that bit, but it is a good question. Uh, I didn't have a question actually, but I just wanted to add one thing to this topic because cold weather is something that I'm much more familiar with. Uh, so yeah, but like, I don't think as far as materials are concerned, they obviously they will have their impact, the cold weather itself. But when I'm researching or measuring something related to ice or snow, there is a lot of constraints when you have specific sensors or something placed there. Um, temperature their operating temperature range kind of affects the choice of sensors that you can make like you may have the best option but you'll have to go for the worst because it doesn't work in those temp so during my master's project we had this thing that i wanted to measure some pressure distributions of the uh, tire contact and it ended up being one of these days like it needed a lot of ad adjustments and it was primarily because the sensor of the so the remote uh, equipment kind of a DAC of the device itself was getting in immediate contact with the ice bed that we had in the rig. Just so, just purely because of that reason, the entire system was not working. And I think uh, as far as your materials are concerned, again, you'll have similar issues. Like in some cold weather, when you're measuring snow temperatures, uh, snow, sorry, snow properties or something, uh, overall, you need to be like in general for the testing devices, you need to be thinking about what the specific uh, cold weather is going, how it's going to affect the material properties of snow, uh, material properties of your device parameters, because 
when you are doing a simulation study, you won't match up the results, leading to more confusions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, so I guess this is the last question since I see, I think the, the last question that Jenna asked was kind of answered um, when you answered the question about the 3D printing. So this question is a little bit more holistic. So I see that you are very um, passionate about the carbon fiber and the manufacturing process of it. So what, what sparked the interest in this area for you? And um, what do you feel the future for this research and carbon fiber work is? Um, you're still muted. should be at the bottom of the screen. Um, what you can do is you can leave quickly and then rejoin again. Hello? Oh, yeah. Yes, you okay. can go. I, I just went in my setting. But, um, so um, for me specifically, I'm actually really interested and in road bikes, there's a lot that are actually being made of carbon fiber. Um, so that was my first exposure essentially to carbon fiber being used in essentially uh, in a vehicle. Um, so just being exposed to it in that sense, I was really interested in actually learning more about the production of carbon fiber if, uh, in other vehicles and, and bicycles as well. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of incidents that happen. Um, it's sort of infamous in the cycling community where carbon fiber bikes are known to be very potentially dangerous due to the failure mechanisms of carbon fiber. Like how I stated earlier, when the carbon fiber fails, it will often fail spectacularly. So you will be riding on a road and over time you'll have built up these, um, these like compound fractures in the matrix that are in the eye and then just all of a sudden it'll just snap on you and all of a sudden your handlebars will not be connected to the bike anymore. Um, so there's a lot of um, issues with manufacturing of carbon fiber parts being available more to the public now and available um, for a lot of manufacturers as well. And um, with a lot of sort of, I would say research and regulation that needs to start being passed and, and for safe products essentially because the process for carbon fiber, um, since the production costs or essentially the materials and the production methods themselves, like I said earlier, anyone could do it. Anyone could design their own molds and design their own parts and create their own carbon fiber parts. So any company can essentially just start making their own carbon fiber parts. Um, but the user danger, um, especially in the, the cycling with carbon fiber bikes is something that, um, was concerning to me at least. And I was sort of given this opportunity to uh, work in the composite institution. And I just thought that was very interesting in terms of exploring specifically lightweighting vehicles with carbon fiber, because that's one thing that you would want a carbon fiber road bike for is because it's so light compared to a steel or aluminum bike frame. And you'll have issues with those bike frames as well, but metallics won't fail. They won't, they won't like out of the blue, like a potentially a carbon fiber bike could just because of varying errors and issues that you have with the carbon fiber frames with aluminum and steel frames. It's a lot simpler. It's either it has a, a visible defect or crack in the frame or it, it has a dent or has some way deformed, but with carbon fiber, it's a lot more dangerous and it's a lot more, um, you have to be very precise in terms of knowing what you're, you're, you're riding and what, what you're getting into. So the passenger safety issue for me is, is probably what mostly got me into this. Okay, that's actually quite interesting. Um, most people, they, they think about the, the cool and nice things about having a carbon fiber uh, product, but you actually consider the, the downsides that there might be. Um, and obviously it is, uh, there are some downsides. So. That's quite interesting. And I, I guess then your research will be in trying to improve 
the fatigue life, if you want to call it that, of carbon fibers, or at least understand it so that you can get to the point where regulations, for instance, can be put up so that people know that if they buy this product, then it has a finite life cycle. Um, and it is, there is a big chance, well, not, not a big chance, but there is a chance that it might, as you said, fail spectacularly. Essentially, yes. So just there's part of the issue is with these consumer products, no one exactly knows when the life cycle of these products should be expected to be um, when the life cycle is up. Essentially, people are seeing these carbon fiber parts and assuming they're indestructible, but they're, they're not. They, they just have to be treated with respect and treated with the way that they were designed for. But sometimes just compound compound small fractures and that sort of thing can damage these parts to where one day one day they will fail but not necessarily we don't know the the exact lifespan of of these products so that's something that uh, definitely needs to be heavily considered going forward as well so. okay um all right i don't see any more questions um in the q a tab so i guess yeah i guess that's it um let me just quickly share my slide. So um, thanks a lot, Addison. It was really informative, especially in terms of the, the carbon fiber, I, th I think, because it's not completely new, but it is relatively new to most people. So I think a lot of um, people, there's still a lot of know-how that needs to be shared uh, in the industry with carbon fiber. So I really appreciate your, your talk today. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Sure, and I, I hope we can we will see you again in the future, um, either SRS events, so student research seminars, or for the Terra Mechanics Bites. Um, it would be nice to have some extra eyes and perspectives on the problems that we're trying to solve in the ISTVS community. All right, so just a outro slide. So um, for anyone that does not know where to find our information um, of these events, we, we call them the digital event series. So for these events, they are um, shown here on the screen. So for more details, you can visit, you can visit any of these websites. Um, and if you are interested in joining ISCBS, uh, you can go to the slash application website and members can log into the members uh, page so that's all from me thanks again addison thanks for the attendees uh, for listening and the great questions that we had and the insightful discussion that we had we'll see you all again next time